Hey everyone, this is Travis. We're with Texas Specialty Hunts. Thanks for tuning in this Friday night. Tonight we're going to discuss uh, Texas exotic hunting, which is uh, a a um, a big thing here in Texas. So, to give you a little background on the exotics in Texas, the first exotics were brought into Texas by the King Ranch, which is in South Texas. And the King Ranch brought in Neil Guy Antelope. So I don't know if you guys can see this, but I've got a We're going to start by discussing these, uh, the introduction of these exotic species in Texas. But like always, you guys, let me know where you're from. Let me know where you're you're watching from, and uh, any questions you guys have, I'd be happy to answer them to the best of my ability. So, so these no guys were brought into the King Ranch in the 1930s. Um, that was the first exotic brought into Texas. It was a Neil guy and into the King Ranch. So later on, the King Ranch decided. You know, this is a really, really good thing. It's good for, um, you know, the conservation of the species uh, to populate and breed and basically get more of them. So they decided that uh, they would go ahead and bring in some water buck. And the water buck did fabulous on the on the King Ranch. The Neil guy did great. So later on, they decided to bring in Lechway and some eland and all these species in south texas you know they they did really well uh today the the king ranch still has a really big population of nilgai they've uh they've reduced their numbers of water buck um i think they pretty much got rid of all the eland they still got a few lechway um these are red lechway or kafui lechway but they're they're doing good, you know. They've they've got a good breeding population, and they're self sustainable. Um, you know, the nil guy they're not they're not doing terrible in their native country, but they're not doing as well as they are in Texas. So that's how it all got started. Later on, some of the other ranches jumped on board, like the Wyo Ranch, and uh, you know they started bringing some species over, started breeding them, and uh, and they did really well as well. But probably the, the best success story that we have here in Texas is it's a very interesting topic. So this was probably 2000, mid 2000. So we have three species in Texas. One is called the Dama Gazelle, one is called the Adax, and one is called the Scimitar Horned Oryx. And so these were named the Three Amigos. And so you know, we've had these on the ranches here in Texas forever. I mean, as long as I can remember, as long as I've been alive, these three species have been in Texas and they breed and they do really, really well. So let's go back and, and talk about these animals in their native country, which is Northern Africa, Chad, Sudan, you know, all the northern part of Africa, it's kind of a sandy region, very deserty. And so these animals back in the 70s in Texas, what I, what I could find was there was about 32 scimitar horned oryx in Texas or neighboring states. But primarily in Texas. Let's say there's 32 scimitar oryx back in 1979. So back in the 70s, these animals were being bred in Texas, the scimitar horned oryx, the addicts, and the dama gazelle. So let's just say we started with 30 scimitar horned oryx back in the 70s, and we have thought to start with two addicts and a few dama gazelles as well. So Keep in mind, this is this is back in the 70s. So today, you know, 
from 32 scimitar horned oryx to two or three addicts, four addicts, two or three dama gazelles, four dama gazelles. So today the scimitar horned oryx population in Texas is estimated to be between 15 and 20,000. It's hard to get an accurate count on how many we actually have in Texas because there's a lot of ranches that don't publicize what they have. And they don't have to because they're basically private livestock and you know the state of Texas has really no comments on what we do with them. Um, they just believe that we're doing the right thing and they stand behind us. Parks and Wildlife does a fabulous job with us guys that raise exotics and they stand behind what we're doing. They know we're doing it for the right reasons. Yeah, we hunt them, but if we if we harvest all the animals we have, we're not going to be able to hunt them. So we selectively harvest and we really breed these animals because we want more of them. The more we have, the more we have for you guys to come hunting. So today we're talking about 10 to 15, 15 to 20,000 scimitar horned oryx in Texas alone. And right now in their native country, they're thought to be extinct. Well, everybody says, why is that? Well, the main reason is food. I mean, these people, you know, they don't hunt to be hunting. They hunt because they're hungry. And so, you know, they, through education, we're trying to, to teach these people that, you know, if they, if done correctly, they can have a sustainable population for food. But, you know, we're just not there yet. We're not there in, in a lot of parts of Africa. Some parts of Africa, we're doing a really good job and they get it. And, and they're really helping out with poaching, et cetera. So right now, I believe they're basically extinct. Scimitar horned oryx, Attic and Attic and Dama gazelle in their native North African countries. We have helped out and to try to repopulate Northern Africa with these three animals, the three amigos. So we've actually sent animals back over there and tried to put them in enclosures and get them started and turn them out, but we've had limited success with with doing this. So, you know, the the future of these animals in their native country doesn't look so good. Um, the future of these animals in Texas look great. Um, you know, U.S. Fish and Wildlife back in 2000, I think it was in 2014, they basically put our our animals in the same category as the animals in Northern Africa. And they said, you know, guys, no more hunting of these animals. If you hunt them, you're going to have to have a, a scientific permit to hunt them, a collection permit. And so, you know, to the ranchers that raise these animals, that became a thorn in their side. So, you know, they just had no real incentive to, to breed these animals if we weren't going to be able to hunt them. But the success of these animals depends on you guys and your hundred dollars to keep these animals thriving. So my point is, as long as there is an end user for these animals and that's you, you guys, the hunter and you guys are becoming more educated on how good the 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 meat is from these animals, and the uh, the trophy side of it's become secondary these days. So, you know, you guys are doing a great job by helping us out, keeping these animals thriving in Texas, and and we've just done a great job on on breeding these animals. You know, hands off to the Exotic Wildlife Association here in Texas; they do a great job. Um, helping everyone manage their herds. Um, so let's talk about uh, let's let's talk about how these herds are managed and what goes on in the exotic industry. So the exotic industry in itself, it it's kind of like a commodity, just like gold, silver, whatever. The prices of animals go up and down depending on supply and demand. So let's just say. You call and say, "Look, hey Travis, I've got, I've got too many um, of these addicts on my ranch. You know, I started out with a herd of ten. Now I've got a hundred, 
can you come in and catch some with the helicopter and move them to somebody's ranch that you know that wants to start a breeding herd? So I say, yes, I'll bring the helicopter over. And so what we do is, um, is we fly these ranches with the helicopter and, and we net them with a, with a gun, with, with a net, with a gun, it's got four barrels, four lead weights. We fly over, we shoot them with a net and then we collect them up, put them in a trailer and we haul them off to whatever ranch that wants to start their new breeding herd. Same with Sable, same with Kudu. Um, you know, if you're doing everything right, pretty soon you're going to have an overabundance of these animals and you're going to need to rehome them. So that's what we do. Um, and it's a, it's a really interesting uh, industry. So there's thousands of animals traded every day between ranches. Um, you know, some animals do well in certain areas. Some animals do well in other areas. So we can't raise them. We can't raise all animals here in San Angelo, and you can't raise all animals in East Texas. So we're all doing our part to make these species, make the number of these species grow each year. And so, you know, we try to breed the heck out of them. And, it, and it's great for the population. If it wasn't for us, you know, basically the three amigos, the scimitar, Wondorix, the Addix, and the Dom and Gazelle would be extinct because they're not coming back in their native country. They're just not doing well, you know, overhunting by the locals and, you know, for food. It's just, it's not a good situation. So we got to do our part um, to keep these animals going. Um, but, and there's some other species that aren't doing so well, but that's kind of what we do. Um, the exotic trade industry, I call them exotic animals. You can call them Texas exotics. You can call them African game, you know, whatever you want to call them. But, um, they're species that are not indigenous to Texas is what I'm talking about. So some of the species that we have, you know, we're looking at somewhere around 70 different species that we have here in Texas. There could be a few more um, today, but let's just say there's 70. Um, I kind of classify them like that, Texas exotics and African game. So our our staple animals that, that we have the most of are the axis deer um, from India, the black buck antelope from India. Um, the fallow deer and um, you know the nail guy so that's that's what we have most of um so you know i guess our pop, most popular animals that people call and want to hunt with us would be the axis the fallow the scimitar hornworks several different sheep species um the oryx, so, you know, we, we have all five species of oryx. We've got the scimitar horned oryx. We've got the Arabian oryx, fringe deer oryx, gimsbach. Um, so we, we've we got them all. And, you know, some of these animals, due to their, their populations in their native countries, like the bongo, uh, the bongo population, the Cameroon and the CAR, they're pretty good. Um, but... The problem today is just, you know, traveling to Cameroon and CAR is probably not like it was 20 years ago. You know, 20 years ago, I knew people that were going there every year and never had any problems. And the travel wasn't such a problem like it is today. So, you know, some of these hunters, they, you know, they want to they wanna have a bongo. Um, Hey Winslow, are you with us? Can you see these slides that I that I put up when I put them up? So, anyway, I had some slides on there, but I don't know if I can get them up for you. I was going to show you some photographs of some of our some of our animals here. Um. So, you know, we have kudu, we have bongo, we have um, inyala, we have black wildebeest, blue wildebeest, Thompson gazelles, Grant's gazelles, um, Audad, several different. Um, okay, so you can see the slides. So, okay, I'm going to pop over these slides and um, 
let y'all look at some of these slides. So, so that was the sable antelope. Um, that's one of our species that we have from Africa here in, in Texas. And, you know, it's a pretty popular species. Um, there's not a, there's not a ton of them, but you know, we've got a good amount. Um, the next slide I'm going to show you is the Transcaspian Uriel sheep. Um, it's a pretty cool animal. So the next slide I'm going to show you is our now lechuae. So this is another. And the three amigos. So the first slide is going to be the Dama gazelle. Second slide is going to be the Adax. Last slide is going to be the scimitar horn oryx. So Dama gazelle, Adax, and scimitar. So there's the, um, the three amigos. Okay. Yeah, there's no audio when I throw those up there, but, um, you know, I just wanted you guys to see some. So let, let's show let's show some of these bongos because bongos are awesome. They're one of my favorites. So that's the bongo that I was talking about. Um, Cameroon, C-A-R, is primarily, you know, where they're harvested. There's a few other places, but um, that's that's primarily where they're harvested. Of course, you know, the kudu, that's always someone's, most people's favorite is kudu. So here is a uh, photograph of our kudu in Texas, and this is a greater kudu. So that's a greater kudu found in uh, in primarily South Africa, but there's you know there's greater kudu in, in lots of places. Um, but everybody loves kudu, so I mean me as well. I mean how could you not? I mean they're awesome. So that slide that I just showed you that was uh, that was a Neil guy antelope. That was the species that was first introduced to Texas in the 1930s by the King Ranch. So that's the Nilgai antelope, sometimes called blue bull. Um, they're from India, and there's a couple other places, but primarily India, um, doing extremely well in Texas, and they're awesome. They're awesome to eat. Big animals, fun hunt, absolutely great hunt. Um, so some of our more common animals, I would say, you know, the axis deer is what we get tons of calls for when we, we hunt a lot of axis deer every year. So here's a slide of you guys um, that's never seen an axis deer this guy is awesome too. So that's the axis deer. Um, the other species that, that we get a lot of requests for is the black buck antelope. Um, here's a photo of the black buck antelope. And then Fallow deer, we get a lot of requests for fallow deer. Fallow deer come in three color phases. So the first color phase is chocolate fallow, spotted fallow, and white fallow. Um, and kind of in order, the white fallow deer seem like, you know, they're the biggest as far as antler size goes. The spotted fallow comes in second, and the chocolate fallow's third. But they're all awesome. Um, here's a pic of the fallow deer. And then we also get a lot of requests on stags, um, red stags. And we, in Texas, you know, we've done a lot of good with these stags. So in Texas, you can actually hunt a stag today that, that scored between 300 and 600. So, you know, we do have 600 inch stag in Texas. 
Uh, when everybody thinks of Red Stag, they think of New Zealand. But in the last five years, we've we've come a long way with our with our red deer stag breedings. And here's a picture of. Uh, So, all right, so some of you guys, <laughs> yeah, Randy, they, they do kind of look like cross between a caribou and an axis. They've got big palmated horns up top, and then they've got, you know, some of them have the spots like the uh, like the axis tier. Um, so, anyway, that's what we do here in Texas is, you know, we breed, we breed exotic animals and you know, we do hunt them, but you know, something's got to something's got to pay us back for what we do. You know, we we breed these animals, we feed these animals, we take care of them, we transport them, um, we private treaties. So, you know, all of you guys, your hunting dollars, all contribute to the survival of these species in Texas. And without us, these these species are for sure going to be extinct in their in their native country especially the three amigos they're in trouble um if they're not already gone in their native country you know you get conflicting stories like the other day i heard that there's three let three uh three addicts left in in northern africa but you know who really knows all we know is they're in trouble and and we need you you guys help to to come in and hunt these guys so we can keep giving back and you know, there's a lot of organizations that are against us and what we do, but, you know, I mean, the writing's on the wall. I mean, if you don't do something, they're, they're either going to eat themselves out of house and home like the elephants in some of the countries where they banned hunting five years ago. And those of you who hunt Africa, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say, but they banned hunting. Um, these elephants and it may have been more than five years ago time flies for me so so what happened was they banned hunting of elephants in this country and so what happens elephants make babies babies get big babies eat a lot uh, big elephants eat a lot they push over trees they drink water and they ate themselves out of house and home so when we were hunting the population was like this, you know, doing this. It was doing good. We had a lot of older elephants. And of course, we only take the older ones because there's no there's no incentive to shoot the younger ones, and we don't want to anyway. So we were on a steady incline with the elephants, and we were managing them properly. And, you know, if you do everything right, the younger generation has better genetics, and we get bigger elephants. Everybody wants to see 100-pound elephants today like they were back in the Roosevelt days, you know, when he was shooting 100-pound tuskers. Um, you know, there's not a lot of those around anymore just because of habitat destruction. So anyway, so basically they either eat themselves out of house and home or the poaching population is so high that they basically shoot them for food and without us protecting them, they're, they're defenseless. Um, same with the rhino herds in South Africa. You know, that's, that's a big topic the last two or three years, and, you know, I don't, I'm really trying to talk about Texas exotics, but this is a correlation between um, having a stable population and having a population that is um, a little bit fragile. So everybody knows that rhino horns are used for medicinal purposes by certain people. Um, so there's only one way you can get rhino horns, and that's for these poachers to come in and either trap them, snare them, shoot them, and cut their horns off. And that's what they do. They totally waste the animal. They come in at night on these private ranches. They shoot the rhinos. They cut their horns off and they grind them up and use them for medicinal purposes. So me personally, I know a guy that's got over 400 white rhinos on his private ranch. So the animal, the rhino population is not in danger. So today it is not in danger. All the media, all the hype, all these other organizations will tell you that the rhino population is in trouble. It is not, not, not. One guy has over 400. And so this guy 
has a full team of people that protect his rhinos because the poaching is so bad. He has, you know, we have sent helicopters over there to help patrol these herds, keep them in check, and make sure the poachers don't get to them. But, you know, it's a giant place. They still get to them. Um, we just try to keep them in check. So what I'm saying is, you know, you guys, you hunters, you guys, dollars that go, you guys go to hunt the rhinos and all that money feeds back into the rhino population. I mean, this guy, he wants his rhino herd to be big and he's got a big herd. And he, and he does that with you guys' dollars. So if we stop hunting, he has no incentive to raise rhinos. And so the rhino population will do the same thing as the dom gazelle, the semitron hornix, horned oryx, and lots of other species. So what we try to do um, in San Angelo is we try to raise certain species that we have the most requests for. So what we concentrate on is some of the animals that, that I spoke of earlier. We try to breed them, and we do a pretty good job at it. And, you know, we, we want to make it a hunt. We don't want it to be um, – we don't want it to be not any fun for the hunter and not any fun for the guides. So we try to make it as challenging as possible um, by putting them on large ranches and hunting them. Um, some are free range, no fences. Some are high fenced. Um, that's up to you guys. If you want to do a free range hunt with us, just tell us. We'll go hunt free range stuff. If you want to hunt behind a high fence, hunt behind a high fence. But I challenge you, axis deer are the hardest animal in the world to shoot behind a high fence. And you can ask anyone, any of the outfitters in Texas. And if you ask any one of those outfitters that have done it for a number of years like I have, if you have a client in for three days, would you rather hunt an axe that's behind a high fence or would you rather hunt it behind a low fence? And I promise you, 95% of those outfitters will say, I'd rather hunt them free range because they're easier. These axes here are so smart when they get in a high fence, they're almost impossible to hunt. Um, we get it done, um, but it's tough. And so what we try to do is, you know, every year we try to estimate however many hunts we're going to have, and we try to make the population on the ranch um, equal that number. We don't try We try not to dip down into age classes. You know, we try to have new ones coming on every year. And so you'll you'll come to the ranch, you'll see axes there that are one years old, two years old, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that's what we try to do is we try to keep that population in check and uh, try not to go back and harvest young animals. So we do that with black buck. We do that with oryx. We do that with sheep. We, we've got a lot of species on the ranch. And, you know, it's fun. It's, a, it, it's fun. You know, these animals are awesome. You know, it's what's really awesome is when I was young, you know, in my 20s, I, I, I hunted all these animals here. You know, I hunted ibex. I hunted kudu. I hunted, you know, and y'all, you name it, I've hunted it. But what was really cool is when I got to go see them in their native country, you know, like um, like the ibex. That was awesome. So when you get to go hunt ibex and get the whole one in their native country, that's that was even cooler for me. And I, I got to see, you know, where these animals came from, what they lived in, and how tough it really was when they're in the wild. So that was that was a cool experience. Um, even kudu and yala, um, you know, stuff like that. It's, it's just really cool to go see them where they live. But, you know, what's funny is the ranch here in San Angelo, um, you know, I've been to South Africa many times, been hunting several places in different countries in Africa, but, you know, it looks a lot like San Angelo. And that's why our animals do so well here at the ranch is because the climate's pretty pretty similar um, pretty dry, uh, moderate winters, uh, when the summers are really hot with little rain, but these animals have adapted. They've done great. Um, so you guys want to come hunt exotics in Texas? Uh, we can fix you up. I mean, we have anything from Cape Buffalo to zebras. So if you want to hunt a Cape Buffalo in, in Texas, come on. If you want to hunt a bongo in Texas, we got them. Kudu, zebra, wildebeest. Um, just about 
just about anything other than primates and cats. We, you know, felines and primates, we, we're not allowed to hunt them here in Texas. Um, we're not allowed to hunt rhinos, um, elephants. So, Randy, yeah, warthog, we've got them. So that's that's a cool subject. I'm, I'm glad you said that, Randy. Is So we've been breeding warthogs here in Texas for a long time. And it's primarily been, you know, captive breeding. Um, but in the last few years, I don't know, if Randy, if you've seen it, but a lot of these warthogs – have been seen on ranches in, in primarily South Texas. Um, so a lot of these, you know, they're diggers. They, they dig like crazy. So um, these warthogs would dig out of their enclosures because they can dig like crazy in South Texas, mainly all sand anyway. So they dug underneath their enclosures and now they're roaming out on ranches that are free ranging, which is, you know, I'm in the I'm in the helicopter business on one end that we hunt problem pigs, but on the other end, I'm on the con conservation side and say, "Ooh, I would love to have a lot more warthog in Texas." But a lot of guys are probably going to throw shoes at me for saying that. But <laughs> but warthogs are cool, man. They're fun to hunt, and it's a great trophy. But I don't know. We'll see. It's too early to tell what, what's going to happen to the warthogs in Texas, but there has been a few seen roaming around, and I've, I've seen a couple of pictures, actually, of lucky hunters actually harvesting a few. So um, all of these species, if you want to look at our website in depth, they're all categorized by, by the name. So if you want to go on there to Texas Exotic Hunting, and there's a list, you can go in and click on the black buck, it's a safe black buck antelope. Click on it. It'll show you a picture of a black buck. It'll show you where they're from. It'll show you how much they weigh, their average height, and what the um, kind of what the hunt's like, the terrain, and all that good stuff. Um, I have most of them on there, from Annex to zebra. I've got I've got probably thirty five or forty of the species on there. Um, now there are some of the species here in Texas that we do not hunt, like harpin zebra, mountain zebras. They're just not on the hunt list, so we don't hunt them. So we breed those just, just to look at. Um, so if you want to go to the website, it's texasexotichunting.net, and look up any one of these species. If you want to book a hunt with us, Mercy and Rob, they do a great job. They're very knowledgeable about all the exotics in Texas. Um, you know, we get a lot of we've been getting a lot of elk hunt um, requests in the last couple of weeks. So I guess a lot of you guys are wanting to hunt elk this year. It's kind of weird. You never know what's going to happen each year. Some years it's red stag, some years it's elk, and some years it's who knows what. But um, I guess the availability of tags are just so limited in the western states, like we discussed in a previous video, that. Um, you know, it's just tough to pull a tag, either land on a tag or a draw tag these days. So people are wanting to hunt them in Texas, which, you know, we've got free range elk as well. So um, if you want to hunt them free range, that's fine. We can do that. If you want to hunt them under the fence, we can do that. Um, Randy, I don't know about um, crossbreeding with feral hogs. Um, we're talking about the warthogs and feral hogs. You know, I just, I don't have any experience with that. Um, you know, the, they, they coexist and have since the beginning of time in Africa with bush pigs. And so to me, a bush pig and a warthog, you know, that, that would be similar comparisons between the, the boars we have in Texas today and the warthog. And so to my knowledge, um, I haven't heard of any of these bush pigs and, um, and warthog interbreeding. So I, I don't think they can. Um, if someone out there knows more about it, then I'm, I would love to hear from you comment, you know, you can go on the, with the Facebook page and comment later on. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll start a discussion on that, but, um, to my knowledge, they will not interbreed, um, with other, um, other types of pigs, but they might, you know, I, I don't know at all, but I've been around a block once or twice in the hunting world. So who knows? Um, that's a good question, though. Um, is there anything else you guys 
want to discuss uh, tonight, or I will let you guys uh, be free. But I really appreciate you guys taking time out on your Friday night and um, and being with us. Um, we also appreciate your business, um, especially all you repeat clients. You know, we we know all you guys have a choice in the hunting industry, and there's a lot of good hunting ranches out there, and there's a lot of good people. But there's a reason why people come back to Texas Specialty Hunts. Um, and I hope that you guys can take the time to come. The new guys can come take the time and come meet our staff, either up in uh, South Dakota at the Pheasant Lodge, at Thunderstick, or here in Texas at Texas Specialty Hunts. Um, and then one of these days, you know, we'll get back on track and do some international hunting again with some of you guys, with our partners in Argentina, Spain, um, Mongolia, um, Turkey. Uh, got fabulous hunting in Turkey. Um, and any of those places, you know, Marco Polo's, High Altai, or Dolly, any of that stuff you want to hunt, just call us and we can hook you up. Um, I go a lot with my clients um, as a guide and help out. So I've been to most of, the, most of these places that can steer you guys in the right direction. So I'm gonna wrap it up for tonight, but uh, thank you guys once again for, for joining us. And I hope to uh, I hope to enlighten you guys a little bit tonight on on the exotics of Texas and what all we have to offer. You know, there's a lot of people out there that, that aren't aware of, of what we do here in Texas. And sometimes I take it for granted. I've just been doing it for so long that I just think, you know, surely by now everybody knows about the exotics in Texas. But, you know, it was brought up to my attention recently that um, that that's not the case. So um, if you guys have any questions, jump on Facebook, call Mercy or Rob or myself. And we'll try to explain and help you guys um, get a hunt booked and steer you in the right direction on how to start out hunting exotic. Because, man, it's a heck of a lot of fun. And uh, it's good for all ages, you know, kids, women, older gentlemen, older ladies. You know, we can accommodate them all. And some of these hard-to-find species that you can't necessarily hunt in their native countries, well, you can hunt them here. So till next week. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Um, can't say that enough. Like our page. Jump on our YouTube channels. Subscribe to our videos. And, uh, you know, we're going to continue this. So uh, I'm enjoying doing this for you guys. And I uh, hope it's a success. So see you guys next week. Thank you.